We all know someone who believes in star signs or body detox. But none of that's really true, and we're going to explain why. This is What Really Matters with Tyler and Matthew on KOWL 1490 The Owl, Tahoe's Talk. First of all, the topic of this episode is pseudoscience. And, you know, like all of the episodes, and like we always say, we need to come up with a definition first. Yeah, we we always need to know what we're talking about before we start talking about it. So pseudoscience, as its name implies, is not science. It's uh, it's simply a form of misconstrued, distorted science that uh, doesn't accurately reflect the scientific method yeah. that we were all taught in school. Sometimes it, it manifests itself in something that outright denies science, or sometimes it's just a simple misunderstanding of what the science actually is. So I think some history first. The scientific method has only been around for perhaps a few hundred years. Yeah. And there was one philosopher in the early 20th century that I think coined the term pseudoscience itself, and his name was Karl Popper. Now, what Karl Popper did was he described the fundamental difference between what he viewed as science and what he viewed as pseudoscience. And it basically was that science seeks to disconfirm their initial hypothesis and that pseudoscience only seeks to confirm. So, right. for example, they're basically an embodiment of confirmation bias. <laughs> so this, yeah, right. So, in a, a way of explaining this is when people go in for a clinical trial, like let's say clinical doctors are testing to see whether a new drug works, then they test it against a placebo. So they have two people go into a group. They have an experimental group, and then they have a control group. They give everyone in the experimental group a drug, you know, that they want to test that works. They give everyone in the control group a control, a placebo pill. Yeah, a sugar pill usually, something like that. And this is so they can demonstrate that the drug that they're actually testing is working better than the placebo. Not just working at all, but working better. Yeah, but because we can trick ourselves into believing something and then we can manifest those... It affects somewhat in in our minds. If we, if you strongly believe in something, you will see slight effects of it. And this that's... is called the placebo effect, yeah. by the way. And the placebo effect, it's kind of interesting how people talk about it because it's more of like bias and illusion than it is actual improvement. So yeah. it, it's more of that the the patients have deluded themselves into thinking it's better. And and surely for things like pain. Uh, relief, then it does affect it because pain is subjective. And so it's highly influenced by subjective factors such as whether you think you're receiving medication or not. But when you're talking about something like uh, curing curing cancer, cancer. oh, we (laughs) We both both went there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, When you're talking about something like cancer, the placebo effect isn't going to do much. It might make you feel better, but it won't cure your cancer and it won't make your cancer go away. So what does this have to do with pseudoscience? And I said, Karl Popper said that science seeks to disconfirm and pseudoscience seeks to confirm. So in in terms of disconfirm, the clinical trials test against the placebo because they want to make sure that their drugs do not just work, but that they work better than something that doesn't work. They're gearing their tests against themselves because they value the results more than they value their own hypothesis. Whereas... In contrast, pseudoscientists... They kind of use confirmation bias to their advantage. When people go into alternative medicine clinics, for example, if their medicine works, then the doctors can say, well, sure, then it worked because it had healing power. But if it doesn't work, they can simply say, oh, well, it doesn't work 100% of the time. So they're using that type of bias to their advantage. They don't know whether it would really work better than a placebo, but they they can just confirm every time it does work and make it seem like that it is actually working because, you know, occasionally by chance, things do just heal themselves on your own. And then you get these crazy stories about how people cured their cancer using detox methods. Right. Yeah. But uh, these are a little more than statistical flukes. I mean, people, some people who get cancer will just be cured of their cancer. Naturally, their body will manage to semi fight it off, you know, in well, very I'd rare like cases. I'd like to point out that Your body has a natural mechanism in place to fight cancer anyway. Well, I mean, obviously, everyone who gets cancer doesn't die from cancer, so we have some natural defenses against it. Which means that 
clearly you can just cherry pick anyone who has who has just been naturally cured of their cancer from taking just basically sugar pills and then you can say look these sugar pills here cancer it's it's not really very rigorous and you see the th- the interesting thing that i found is it seems like sometimes i uh, i mean you have to be some person that buys into conspiracy theories to believe that alternative medicine because yeah. at a certain point you have to realize that the doctors have probably already tested alternative medicine. You know that they've done cl- yeah. clinical trials. I mean, I, I, I mean, I saw a really great uh, quote. <laughs> it was, um, you know what they call alternative medicine that works? Medicine. It's, I right. mean, when alternative medicine is proven to work, it becomes regular medicine at that point. I mean... Well, just think about it for a second. If it worked, then why wouldn't drug companies capitalize on that and make tons of profit curing cancer? It... it you have to believe in some type of worldwide conspiracy. And so, you know, that that's the type of people that are coming up with these alternative medicine things. Yeah. Obviously not the types of charlatans that you want to hang out with. <laughs> yeah. And it sort of has its connections to astrology. Now, there's a difference between astrology and astronomy. They sound really similar, but there's a <laughs> there's big quite difference. A, there's quite a divide between them. <laughs> One is an age-old science that's been practiced since the Grecian times. The other is pseudoscience that has been practiced just as long. <laughs> well, actually, I, I mean, you said that astronomy has been practiced for a long time. And that's true that parts of it have. Oh, okay. Yeah. But I think more of like astronomy... Astronomy kind of developed out of astrology, and it was the same for alchemy and, and chemistry. You see, you had yeah. alchemists in the past, and then chemistry grew out of that because people realized, well, this can be a rigorous science, and then that's that's what spawned chemistry. And the same thing with, that happened with astronomy. But for some reason, unlike alchemy, I, don't, I mean, I don't hear about anyone talking yeah. about how they can turn lead into gold. <laughs> yeah, nobody's but, talking about that anymore. But I do hear people talking about their star sign or, or what month you were born into and what that means according to the stars. You know, things like horoscopes. I'm surprised anyone believes it in, in today's modern world. Yeah, well, it's it's one of the textbook examples of confirmation bias when you start taking an introductory uh, psychology class. Because... The horoscopes are designed in such a way that you'll find a horoscope that fits sort of what you've been going through. You'll find one that sort of fits with your life, and then because we want it to be so right, we'll just sort of warp it in our mind and say, oh, that is sort of what happened, right? It was absolutely correct. Yeah, so just like the charlatans, and I guess I've said charlatan twice anyway just like the just like the charlatans in uh in pseudoscience in terms of alternative medicine the astrono- astrologists use that to their advantage as well every time that they're right then they can say well i do have some predictive power but every time they're wrong then you just forget about it yeah it's it's a very it's a very deeply ingrained psychological bias and something and I, think- I i don't really understand about astrology if it was true everyone would lead parallel lives like, if, if the stars actually told 1 in 12 people what... The, or is there 24? I don't know. If it, I, don't, I don't know the yeah. specific details of it. <laughs> if it. If it actually managed to predict people's lives, wouldn't there just be, like, 12 to 24 different life paths you could be on? Well, the thing like, is, it's so, it's so vague that anyone can be on these life paths. Anyone can follow these advice. You see, the thing is, is you, you know that it's pseudoscience because of how vague it is. If, if people were confident in the ability for horoscopes to predict their life, then they would have more detail in them. Yeah, in, instead of saying something like, you will meet someone who will impact you, they could say, you'll meet a guy named Greg walking his dog on Tuesday. Like, if they had actual predicting power, they could be more specific. And we've kind of we've kind of picked on astrology and alternative medicine, and I think we might actually re- return to alternative medicine because there are very many branches of alternative medicine, <laughs> oh, yeah. which we can we can definitely delve into each one of them. But also things, you know, I used to believe that the Bermuda Triangle was a real thing, and that that's that's a big that's a big one. I mean. There's so many conspiracy theories revolving around the Bermuda Triangle. I'm pretty sure everyone in the U.S. has at least heard of the Bermuda Triangle. You see, to me, though, for most of the, for most of my life, it was so deeply ingrained that I hadn't even thought about it. I hadn't even imagined that it was a conspiracy theory type thing. I had just thought, oh, maybe there's some region at the Atlantic that strange things happen. And that was, 
I mean, I generally pride myself in being scientifically minded, but it was so deeply ingrained yeah. that I hadn't thought about that maybe it was all just made up by conspiracy. I thought legitimate people believed in it and it was a real phenomenon. Yeah, uh, I mean, I was sort of on the same coin. I, I was just looking into everything I could. And then one day, while I was, you know, so, sort of young, um, I stumbled a across a Discovery documentary that just blew the Bermuda Triangle completely out of the water. <laughs> it it explained all of the instruments going wrong, all of the displacement. It, it was talking about how there's um, a high likelihood of mirages, how there's a high likelihood of rogue waves, which are waves that are way bigger than like a regular wave. They were talking about how um, a type of gas that leaks up from the water interferes with people's instruments. I mean, usually... When science starts getting involved in pseudoscience, you see there's more complex things at work than magic. Well, I think it's funny, and not to pick on you specifically, but you kind of like referenced a, uh, a documentary to prove your point. But that's actually, I've heard, heard that a lot before, where if someone starts talking about some wacky pseudoscience, <laughs> they just reference this documentary and they say, oh, well, you have to watch this documentary or you won't believe me. I don't, okay, I think yeah, people, that's fair enough. People fair have enough. this idea, and I know we, we teach children, don't believe everything you read, don't believe, don't believe everything you hear. Yeah, I mean, even this right now. Yeah. But I, I don't think it's, we need some way for it to sit in children's minds that not every documentary is, is true. Uh, not every yeah. book is true. Not every article you see is true. They have to understand, you, you know that guy from like film class who was always sort of slacking and he and he was just, you know, off doing his own thing. That guy might be making documentaries, okay? <laughs> it's documentary filmmakers are human beings. They're not robots who go out and search for perfect factual stories. I think that's something people confuse documentary makers as like scientists. You know, making a documentary isn't exactly the same type of field as doing science. So I think it's I think it's important to make that uh, distinction. Yeah, it, I mean, documentaries take a lot of dedication and hard work, but dedication and hard work does not make facts. You know, and of I mean, obviously, like this might be more like a grade level education, but look at their credibility for one. This is what really matters with Tyler and Matthew on KWL fourteen ninety The Owl, Tahoe's Top. We've all sort of, uh, we all went through this one. Um, the 2012, uh, so the Y2K of this century. Well, you know what? What I remember from that was that no one really believed in it. I think more of the widespread phenomena that people have, especially world ending apocalypse level events, there are only a small s a subset of people that actually believe it. So I'm not sure yeah. that one is really too big. Well, you know, I, I, think I, I think I I think I speak for everyone though, not for everyone. For I speak a for people. a lot of people. For our listeners, they're, when, they're smarter than average. Yeah. <laughs> when I say that there's there were some people who die hard believed that the world would end in 2012 because of a calendar made by some ancient people. Well, I did but, hear things about how the Mayans had some foresight or foreknowledge yeah but i mean that's basically what it was <laughs> that's what it was but i didn't meet a lot of people actually believing the world no. was going to end well the most the most intriguing thing about this though is that it sort of creeped into everyone's minds didn't it i mean i i always said people saying i always heard people saying of course the world isn't gonna end but, maybe but the if Mayans it does are, yeah. yeah it <laughs> was i mean it's <laughs> it, well, it's it's funny we took it seriously. Maybe it was because of that movie that came out three mm -hmm. years earlier. That's probably one of the reasons. But I think probably more of the influential pseudosciences are not the ones that have some passing uh, time period. You know, 2012, yeah. no one can believe in it after in, two, in the year 2013. Right, but things, you know, more subtle things. Like, did, did you know that lie detectors, they're, it's just completely made up. Oh, it's all yeah. pseudoscience. This is this is one of my favorite pseudoscientific beliefs to poke holes in because lie detectors are really not as accurate as you think they are. I mean, they it sounds scientific is is the most intriguing part about lie detectors, you know, measuring heart rate or sweat levels or things like that. But then you think about it and you realize raising the room temperature a lot can make someone beep on a lie detector test. Well, the problem is that lies are very 
They're very mental. It's yeah. something that's happening in your mind. And lies are, are just another thought process of yours. It doesn't mean that something's going to happen physiologically because you lie. That's like saying every time you talk about the sky, something's going to happen physiologically, like you'll sweat in some certain pattern. Yeah, lying is a psychological phenomenon. So the idea that it would be present physically, it's just odd. I mean, there's just no reason to believe that lie detectors work. In fact, there's no evidence to suggest that lie detectors are... Well, no, uh, no credible body of evidence to suggest that lie detectors actually detect lies. I mean... Consider this is something that is used in court hearings. Like, well, I don't, I don't think so much anymore. I did read about how that was kind of an issue that people believed in it, and I think, I think it speaks to the problem of people not being educated. I'm guessing in the yeah. in the court system, and it's also, I mean, let's be frank, it's also the fault of shows like CSI, where they oh, take Law and Order, where yeah. they they take. Seriously, like, n- no one questions the lie detector. Mm-hmm. They, they take them in and say like, things like, okay, objectively, this lie detector is the say-all, end-all, and if you, if you don't pass it, then... Well, think about it for a moment. If it was really that accurate, then how would murderers be able to get away with murder? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, in the courtroom, you just have to make them take a lie detector test, and if it was really that accurate, then they would go to jail every time, and you would never have innocent people going to prison, and you would only have guilty people going to prison. Mm-hmm. Obviously, that doesn't happen, so we don't have some surefire way of determining whether someone's lying or whether someone yeah. isn't. It's nice to think that we have a machine that can tell when someone's lying, because I think deep down, we all would like to know for sure that there is a way to know when someone is lying. But really, it's just all, it's just all pseudoscience. There's, there's just, there's no, there's no evidence for it. Okay, well, I wanted to, I wanted to basically talk about, at this point, some of our skeptical viewers, I I guess skeptical in the sense that you might be skeptical of science or whatever. Yeah. You might be thinking that, uh, you know, this is just two dudes saying things and, uh, you know, I mean, maybe. You're kind of right. (laughs) There's not, there's not too much reason to believe that we have credibility, but keep in mind that the things we're saying, it's backed up by scientists. If you, I mean, if you look it up. Yeah, we, I mean. This is the mainstream body of science saying this. We're, we're simply spokes spokespeople for the yeah. for the scientific body we encourage you to look stuff up after the after the show like a- after you're done listening it's be- it's best if you look the look these things out on your own that's you know? ultimately the encouragement too because we've already told you that you shouldn't believe everything you hear and you're hearing us right now <laughs> yeah so if anything this should be a wake-up call not just to believe what we're saying, you know, robotically or just, oh, you know, like, oh, I heard it on what really matters. Therefore, I have to tell my friends, did you know lie detectors aren't real? <laughs> yeah, it's d- more of- look it up yourself. Find find out. That's how pseudoscience becomes science or becomes disproven. Look- and then, that's how it starts, though, because people people hear from a family member or they hear from their from their friend. They hear uh, chiropractic works. Did Ooh, you know that? Yeah. And yeah. it just sits in a seat in their mind, and they keep hearing it over and over again. And then any any time that someone makes an opposing opinion, any time that someone says, well, I heard that was all pseudoscience, mm-hmm. then they just re- disregard it. They just reject it from their mind. Yeah. And I, I don't think we should gloss over chiropractic there. Or chiropractic? Chiropractic work? <laughs> Chiropract. I don't know. I <laughs> I don't think we can gloss over uh, this field. the practice <laughs> of chiropractology. You you can't gloss over that because this is something I'm sure most everyone who's listening has heard from their friends and their family. They've heard it around. You've seen it on TV. I mean, it's sort of universal in the U.S. You know. It, it's something that helps you. It's it's science, but again, not really. It is pseudoscience. Well, you see, earning a chiropractic degree isn't the same thing as earning a medical degree, which no. should speak f- for a little bit in that. But it's also I don't think I don't think people have researched into the theory of chiropractic. It doesn't follow the mainstream science in the sense that uh, some some chiropractors don't even believe in the in the germ theory of medicine. And obviously that should say something about the field because I would, I would, it would be hard to find a single medical doctor that doesn't believe in the germ theory of medicine. 
But the whole theory, uh, it's nonsense. And I, I encourage you to just look it up yourself. Because if you thought that people who practiced chiropractic were just people that helped your back, you haven't read into it far enough. Yeah. They have this whole body of, of, of beliefs. It, it's, it's like a mythology of how the human human body works. Oh, yeah. And it's similar in some ways to nutritionists. I, I think we've all seen on the TV or something like that, some uh, some nutritionist coming on and telling you about how to diet or what you should eat this month so that you can lose so much weight. Or, oh, now this food is bad for so-and-so in your body, so you shouldn't do such and such. So, I mean, this might be surprising to the listener. They might not think of nutritionists as pseudoscientists. Which, in reality, if someone's calling themselves a nutritionist, it doesn't mean they're practicing pseudoscience. It's not a protected term. No, yeah, simply all we're saying is that nutritionists, you can, anyone can call themselves a nutritionist. I'm a nutritionist, and Matthew's a nutritionist too, and so are you. (laughs) It's not an official title. If you say that you have a PhD in theoretical astrophysics, then that means that you had to earn your degree from a university, and it it has backing. If you call yourself a nutritionist... That's just saying you know a lot about nutrition. <laughs> yeah. It's like saying I'm an expert in theoretical astrophysics versus saying I have a degree. And, and I'm sure there's some people out there thinking right now, well, gee, if I can't listen to nutritionists, who can I listen to? Surely there's someone who studies diet in the human body. Well, the, the actual term for doctors that study diet and nutrition is dietitians. Dietitians. Listen to dietitians, not nutritionists. Saying nutritionist is like saying spaceologist. <laughs> There's just no backing to well, it. Well, it's like saying you're an astrologer rather than an astronomer. <laughs> exactly. There's... Listen, it's incredibly important with dietary uh, science in particular. Um, one, one thing I've heard quite a bit from dietitians is you should listen to your body <laughs> because <laughs> you're <laughs> okay this doesn't sound too scientific <laughs> okay no, no 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 no. but what what i'm saying is eight glasses of water a day that doesn't matter drink when you're thirsty eat what seems kind of healthy to you be- because there's mm, seems kind of healthy i'm not sure it's about a this general guide of course you need to look into nutritional science but a lot of people just won't so you know most people intrinsically have the idea that broccoli is healthier than chocolate you know Okay, well, I see, uh, now I see where you're coming from. Yeah, it, it's not that your body has a magical, mystical detecting device that will lead you towards the right food. It, mostly, it's just common sense. I mean, you just need to eat modest portions, and you need to drink when you're thirsty, and eat when once you're full instead of once your plate is empty. It, it's well, basic stuff. It's kind of, it's kind of funny because uh, we hear a lot of conflicting advice about nutrition, and then people hear so much confl- conflicting advice that they think that means that the experts don't know what they're talking about. When in reality, they've just heard conflicting advice from their health instructor or, the, you know, their coach or something. No, the experts, sure, they have their disagreements and there's there's always going to be scientific controversies. But that doesn't mean that it, this it's all just speculation. It doesn't mean that there isn't any field of study that knows that basically knows what it's talking about. I think the most important thing when discussing uh, when discussing pseudoscience, a lot of this can be averted by just looking it up. I mean, and looking it up in the right way. Yeah, you uh, people, we are, we are all subject to confirmation bias. We are all subject to the idea that okay, um, this is right and this is right because I heard it here and so and so. Frankly, you need to look at a diverse list of sources and you need to look at, as messy as it sounds, academic papers. It's the best way to sort of sift through and scientific if, information. And of course, just don't believe anything you read, even if it's scientific research. Yeah. Because sometimes, I mean, there's there's a load of issues with scientific research. <laughs> I thought that was that was a problem, or it still is a problem, that sometimes scientists cherry-pick their results. And you, you know what? One thing that, that I want to leave you with, because it might sound all too complicated, who do I who do I trust? The scientists, the, the co-hosts of what really matters, <laughs> yeah. my, my doctor, my friend. The thing is, one thing you need to remember is that the world is complicated. 
There's going to be a lot of people saying different things. Follow the evidence. It, follow follow logic, and yeah. you might you'll probably arrive at L- the right answer. Look things up yourself. Don't let people, even people on the radio with the very reputable radio show, don't let even us tell you what's right and what's wrong. Just keep learning. Stay curious. This is what really matters with Tyler and Matthew on KWL 1490 The Owl. Tahoe's Talk. See you next week. Goodbye.